Hi, I'm Christelle Vilfrank, and today I would like to explore the question, who protects the liver when it faces a threat? But first, I'd like to talk about a Brita pitcher that I purchased back in college. It was pretty simple. Whenever the filter in the pitcher needed to be switched out, an indicator would come on and tell me that I needed to switch it out. However, after having the pitcher for years, it started malfunctioning. Similarly, the second largest organs in our body, the liver, it acts as its own form of a filtering system. See, a healthy liver is able to assist in breaking down a number of different substances that enter into our body, from foods to medications and other things. However, if the liver is threatened by a form of injury, we have a different story happening. When a form of injury threatens a healthy liver, the fatty diet in this case, it can have the healthy liver transform into more of a fatty liver. Then if that injury persists, that fatty liver can then progress to a more serious form of liver disease called fibrosis. And up until this point, these liver disease stages are still reversible, meaning that our filtering system, the liver, it's able to actually repair itself and it can actually reduce that damage that occurred over time if it's allowed the time to recover. So the liver is actually able to regenerate itself. Unfortunately, if the liver continues to be threatened with an in a form of injury, what we see is that the fibrotic liver can then progress to a point of no return where it can become more diseased. It can become a cirrhotic liver, and that can later progress to one of the most common forms of liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, or HCC. See, at that point of no return, those disease stages that follow it are irreversible, meaning that our liver that's usually able to repair damage is no longer able to do so to the levels that it once could. And the issue here with these irreversible diseases is that the only form of treatment is liver transplant surgery. And being on a transplant list is not really ideal for those patients because they're often on these lists for a very long time. Some of them don't actually survive to the point that they make the top of the list. And some of them are honestly not great candidates to even be put on the list or to be chosen for the liver transplant surgery. And those of them that are good candidates or who survive to the point that they get to that top of that list, not all of the time are these surgeries actually buying them more survival time. So there is a great need for treatment options for chronic liver diseases, such as these diseases that are past the point of no return. But what if we had an indicator that warned us of our liver's vulnerability to injury? It's like my Brita pitcher. What if I had an indicator that told me that my liver was gonna start malfunctioning? And I think that I study one of those indicators or markers. I study a very huge protein called Bruce, and I've nicknamed Bruce, Bruce Almighty. Bruce Almighty because he's involved in a number of different cellular functions, from inhibiting cell death, to promoting the degradation of proteins by the proteasome, to facilitating DNA repair. Bruce has his hands in a lot of different functions and has proven to be very important for our bodies and our organ systems. But what happens when we lose Bruce? To answer this question, previous lab members decided to delete both copies of Bruce in a mouse and try to see what would happen. Unfortunately for them, those mice were actually embryonic lethal, meaning that they could not be carried to term. What they found was that the control mice, they had normal yolk sacs and normal placentas. However, the mice that had Bruce knocked out, their yolk sacs and their placentas were defective. And so they were not able to be carried to term. And so knowing this, those previous lab members decided maybe deleting both copies of Bruce was a little bit dramatic. And so instead of deleting both copies, they decided to delete a single copy of Bruce. Fortunately for them, those mice actually survived. But unfortunately, what they found was those mice developed spontaneous liver tumors, and that is being pointed out by these yellow arrows. 
These liver tumors happened after only 10 months of age, and that's with no form of injury, no special diets. These mice were just living and developed tumors. This happened at an 11% incidence compared to the wild type mice. Those mice with a single copy of Bruce or heterozygous Bruce mouse, they actually had hepatocellular carcinoma. And that was confirmed by our pathologist that we usually work closely with. And he confirmed these are indeed hepatocellular carcinoma, which is interesting for us because hepatocellular carcinoma is the fourth most common cause of cancer-related deaths worldwide. Patients with hepatocellular carcinoma are often asymptomatic and they can actually be diagnosed at later stages of the disease. And so it's usually a little bit too late for interventions to happen. And so with this in mind, and knowing that Bruce seemed to be doing something in the mouse liver, our collaborator, the pathologist, he donated human patient samples to us. And he asked us, what do you guys think the Bruce levels looked like? And so in our lab, what happened was the previous members, they decided to incorporate a technique called immunohistochemistry, which is basically a staining to look at different markers. So the brownish staining would help us detect whether or not there was bruise present and what those levels looked like. Looking at the intensity of that staining, we can get an idea of how much bruise is there. And so when we stain those livers, those liver biopsies for bruise, what we found in the normal tissue or the normal adjacent tissue, which is basically tissue that is close to disease tissue, those normal adjacent tissue seem to have a great level of bruise, looking again at that brown. But when we look at more chronic liver diseases, such as hepatitis, cirrhosis, and HCC, those livers seem to have less brown. That suggests that there's less bruise. By the time we get to HCC, we see that bruise levels are barely detectable. And so this told us mouse data, as well as this data, suggests that Bruce is probably aiding in protecting both the mouse and the human livers. And so it's probably pretty important. Bruce Almighty striking again. But what if we knock out Bruce in the liver? That was the question I decided to ask when I joined the lab. Because of course, if we had a heterozygous mouse that only had a single copy of Bruce, they developed spontaneous liver tumors. Of course, if I decided to knock out Bruce in the liver, it should surely create disease. It should be a more dramatic HCC than what those heterozygous mice developed. Unfortunately for me, that didn't happen. Those livers looked exactly like our control livers. The Bruce liver specific knockouts or LKOs to the eye, it looked like those livers were healthy livers. They seemed normal. And I was a bit bummed by this, but I thought, let's not panic. What if we decide to threaten or give a form of injury to those Bruce deficient mouse livers? Maybe there could be a chance for my dissertation research. And so I decided to subject those normal livers to a form of liver injury. And what I used was diethylnitrosamine or DEN. We decided to inject those mice both the control mice as well as the Bruce deficient liver knockouts or the LKO with the DEN. And we decided to look at what would happen. One of those immediate stress responses is cell proliferation. And what I found was that when I did another staining of both the control as well as the Bruce deficient livers, I found that looking at a cell proliferation marker, in this case, KI67, I could determine how many cells were proliferating in these liver tissues. And so in the control mice, we're seeing a little bit of cell proliferation, but in the liver specific knockouts, those livers that are deficient for bruise have an increase of cell proliferation. Another stress response is infl inflammation. And so when I decided to look at an inflammation marker and measure its gene expression to see whether or not it is active or get a suggestion of its activity. In this case, I used tumor necrosis factor alpha to look at its gene expression level. And that would give me a suggestion of how much inflammation these livers might have. And when I looked at the liver specific knockouts, they had an increase of that inflammation marker, suggesting an increase of inflammation compared to the control. 
So remember when I told you that our Boost Almighty protein is able to help facilitate DNA repair? The way that it's able to do this is once there is a form of DNA damage, if there is a form of either a double strand DNA break or a single strand DNA break, we see that the presence of Bruce is able to allow for the recruitment of a number of different repair proteins. So when there's a double strand DNA break, the ATM kinase will bind to the sites of damage. It'll be phosphorylated or activated, and that will cause for the recruitment of the other repair proteins. However, when there's a single strand DNA break, the ATR kinase mostly responds there, and it will be phosphorylated and activated, and its presence will allow for the recruitment of other repair proteins. These processes only happen when there is the presence of bruise. So bruise being present at the sites of damage allows for the recruitment of the repair proteins and the facilitation of efficient DNA repair. And so I decided to look at what happens when the livers were exposed to DEN. I tried to look at ATM activity, but it didn't seem that DEN was causing any activation of ATM. But when I looked at ATR activity, I found that the control livers had more of an increase of ATR activity. This was measured again by looking at the brownish staining of the cells. The brownish cells would suggest to us that there is ATR activity. It seemed to be increased in the control livers, but when we take a look at the liver-specific knockouts or the livers deficient of bruise, there seems to be less ATR activity, indicated by less brownish cells. Even in livers, Bruce is proving that it's necessary for facilitating DNA repair. And so since there's not much DNA repair happening in the liver-specific knockouts, I wanted to measure the levels of DNA damage. And what I found was that when I looked at a global DNA damage marker and I counted all of those positive cells, those positive brownish cells that would tell me or give me an idea that there is DNA damage happening in these cells, what I found is that in the control mice, of course, they get a form of DNA damage. DN causes DNA damage. However, because they had that intact ATR activity to help facilitate DNA repair, that DNA damage, those levels in the control livers go down over time. However, with the liver-specific knockouts, we get that spike of DNA damage eventually at day three. But over time, those livers are not able to resolve the DNA damage to the levels of the control mice. And that proved that Bruce liver deficiency increases DNA damage in mice that are exposed to DEN. And so let's go a little bit further. I wanted to see what would happen to those mice when they were exposed to DEN for such a long period of time. So we asked the question, are Bruce deficient livers more susceptible to chronic liver diseases? And so let's take a look at that last stage of liver disease where the liver damage is still reversible. Let's take a look at liver fibrosis and see what happens. But let's first explain what liver fibrosis is. Again, the liver can get threatened with injury because it's taking on a number of different things that are entering our bodies. And so when we have hepatocytes, which are the most common cells in the liver, they make up about 85% or more of the liver. And so when hepatocytes are threatened by injury and they get injured, they will release pro-inflammation signals. Those pro-inflammation signals will cause for the recruitment of immune cells. Some of those cells are called hepatic stellate cells, and they're normally quiet or inactive. However, when we get the recruitment of all of those immune cells, the normally quiet hepatic stellate cells become activated. And that activation of hepatic stellate cells or HSCs is important because that's actually the biggest contributing factor to liver fibrosis. Because activated hepatic stellate cells, they overproduce the extracellular matrix components. We're talking about collagens, et cetera. All of those different components that are in the extracellular matrix, the overproduction of them is what causes for the scarring of the liver that we often find in liver fibrosis. So when we looked at the livers of the mice that were exposed to DEN, we found that as early as six months of exposure to DEN, the liver-specific knockouts seemed to have an increase of collagen deposition. 
I measured collagen deposition by staining those livers with a technique called serious red staining. So the serious red staining allows for the collagen that's in the liver to be stained with this reddish color. And so when I looked at the reddish color, I see that there is more in the liver specific knockouts indicating more of an increase of collagen deposition. When we looked at collagen deposition in the mice that were exposed to DEN for eight months, we see that it's also increased compared to the controls. But let's look at those activated HSCs or hepatic stellate cells. Remember, those are the cells that contribute to the overproduction of the extracellular matrix or ECM. And that is what is usually promoting fibrosis. And so when we stained liver tissue samples of the mice that were exposed to DEN for activated HSCs, we find that there's more brownish staining in the liver specific knockouts. That brownish staining is letting us know that there's more of an activation of hepatic stellate cells in this case. And so I decided to stay at that time point at eight months of exposure. And I took some of the livers and I prepared RNA from them and I sent their RNA to be sequenced because I wanted to look at what genes might be upregulated or downregulated in those livers at that specific time point. And I found that there was an increase of both inflammation as well as extracellular matrix or ECM related markers in the liver specific knockouts. When I looked at more fibrosis related markers, I found that there was also an increase of those markers in the livers that were deficient for bruise. And so I took it a step further and looked at that final time point of 14 months and found that there is still this activation of the hepatic stellate cells. And so that's likely what's contributing to fibrosis susceptibility in Bruce liver deficient mice. And so those mice seem to be more susceptible to fibrosis than their controls. And so let's move past that reversible disease and get to the point of no return. Let's look specifically at tumor formation and getting into HCC development. And what I found was that after eight months of exposure to DEN, the bruised liver specific knockouts developed tumors. And what happened was that the control mice did not develop tumors until about 10 to 12 months of exposure to DEN. And that happened at about a 50% incidence. But by then, all of the bruised liver specific knockouts had already developed tumors. By 14 months, which was the final time point, only 80% of the wild type mice developed tumors and 100% of those bruised liver specific knockouts had tumors. And when we had our trusty pathologist take a look at those livers, he confirmed that all of the livers in the 14 month time point were actually HCC. But this is what it looked like. If you take a look by your eye, the liver specific knockout livers look more engrossed with tumors. It looks a little bit dramatic or exacerbated, if you will. And so I decided to look at the histology of those livers. And so I did a special staining. In this case, I'm doing a hematoxylin and eosin staining. And that would give me an idea of just what the liver histology looks like in these two genotypes. What I found was that the liver specific knockouts, they had more signs of fatty liver, and that's shown by those white balloonish looking figures. Additionally, they also had something called a trabecular staining pattern, which is a disruption of the hepatic plate. And that is demonstrated by that dark purple lining that's going out. And what we found was that that trabecular staining pattern, that disruption, was actually a key component that healthcare providers use when they're looking at human HCC. And it's actually correlated with poor prognosis in humans. And so I decided to look at one of those stress responses again, cell proliferation. I found that as early as three months of DN exposure, this is before tumors form, there's already this increase of cell proliferation in the liver specific knockouts compared to the controls. At eight months, which again is the time of tumor onset in the liver specific knockouts, we are still seeing this increase of cell proliferation. When we look further to the mice that already have HCC and we decided to stain those livers, we saw again, there was this increase of cell proliferation. 
So, so far I've shown you that when there is bruised liver deficiency in the mice, those mice develop tumors faster and it seems that they are having more of an exacerbated HCC phenotype. But what other factors are contributing to their HCC? And so some, one of the factors I wanted to look at was the presence or the mutations of different oncogenes. Oncogenes are genes that usually drive cancers. One of the oncogenes that I wanted to look at in this case was beta-catenin because beta-catenin is found to be mutated in up to 50% of human HCC patient samples. And that mutation is normally an activating mutation of, of beta-catenin. And so when I looked at the livers that were exposed to DEN and I stained those livers for beta-catenin, I found that there was an increase of nuclear positive beta-catenin cells. That told me that there was a suggestion that the beta-catenin is active because when beta-catenin is activated, it can be stabilized in the cytoplasm and it can also move to the nucleus. When I looked at the time of tumor onset for the liver-specific knockouts, I found that there was still this increase of nuclear beta-catenin in the liver-specific knockouts compared to the controls. And when we get to the final time point, at 14 months, when those controls as well as the liver-specific knockouts have already developed HCC, we're still seeing that there's more of nuclear positivity of beta-catenin in the liver-specific knockout tumors compared to the control tumors. And so I wanted to look at the gene expression of beta-catenin. And I found that there was an increase of gene expression in the liver-specific knockouts by the time those mice have HCC. But I also looked at the protein levels. So it wasn't just happening at the mRNA level, it's also happening at the protein level. There's more beta-catenin protein being produced in the liver-specific knockouts compared to their controls. Being that beta-catenin gets to the nucleus, it's able to act as a transcription factor and it's able to promote the transcription of other genes. And so one of its targets that it's able to promote its transcription is cyclin D1. And I measured the protein levels of cyclin D1 and found that those protein levels were, were seen to be increased in the liver-specific knockouts compared to the controls. And so I took it a step further. Instead of just looking at the mice and what happens with them, I decided to look at human a, a human HCC cell line. And I decided to look at the phosphorylation of beta-catenin at serine 675. This phosphorylation site is important because that is what allows for beta-catenin to be stabilized as well as moved to the nucleus. And it gives us more of a suggestion that beta-catenin is activated. So when we measure the levels of phosphorylation of beta-catenin at serine 675, we see that it is increased in those knockout cells, those human HCC knockouts. And that tells us that without Bruce, there is this increase of beta-catenin being stabilized, and that's causing it to be hyperactive compared to the controlled cells. And so I wanted to ask, is Bruce a good marker for measuring chronic liver disease susceptibility? And so when we look at the highlights of this study, we find that as early as three to four months of exposure to DEN, the liver-specific knockouts already have an increase of cell proliferation. Additionally, the liver-specific knockouts seem to have an increase of nuclear beta-catenin, which is the oncogene that we know promotes HCC development in humans. As early as six months of exposure to DEN, the liver-specific knockouts also developed fibrosis. By eight months, they developed tumors, and we did not see tumors in the control mice until 10 months of exposure to DEN. By the end time point of 14 months, both the normal mice or control mice had HCC as well as the liver-specific knockouts. However, I hope you remembered, the control mice only developed HCC at an 80% incidence compared to the 100% incidence we found in those livers that were deficient of bruise. Not only did they de all develop HCC, but they seemed to have more of an exacerbated HCC phenotype compared to the controls. And so what's next? What did we learn from this study? So not only did this study show us or demonstrate to us that our Bruce Almighty protein is able to help in protecting the liver 
We should all consider Bruce to be a marker or an indicator. It could potentially help us tackle the issues that we have with liver disease in this country. With that, I'd like to thank the iBiology team, and I'd like to thank my lab, both past and present, my graduate program, as well as all of my funding. Thank you.